Micah chapter 7 is where we're going to be at today if you have your Bibles. Someone said that they're going to need help finding that. So uh, it's in the Old Testament uh, after Psalms. Uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Jeremiah, uh, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Okay, so uh, I don't know if that was helpful at all, but uh, if it wasn't, uh, I mean, let's be honest. Most of you are on your phones anyways, and you're just looking for the one that says Micah. So that's a lot easier. We're going to be doing the entire chapter 7 of the book of Micah, which is 20 verses long, but don't worry, I had four shots of espresso this morning, so I am uh, revved and ready to go. So uh, we're going to get through this, but uh, on Friday nights with our young adults ministry, I've been doing uh, the book of Micah over the last couple of months and taking a look at what this Old Testament prophet has to say. And chapter 7 is a, is a great chapter for the book of Micah because it, it really pulls all of the thoughts that Micah has presented into a, into a clear conclusion to present the reality of what the nation of Israel is facing, but the truth about who their God is. How many of you are like me, and maybe you yourself have wondered this in the past or struggled with this thought in the past, or, or you know somebody who has maybe voiced this, this struggle uh, to you, but how many of you have ever uh, either known somebody or you yourself struggled with the God of the Old Testament. Anyone been like that? Maybe you've personally looked at the Old Testament and, and what you know about the stories of the Old Testament and you've gone, well, what's going on with God here? Or maybe you have somebody who says to you something like this, that maybe you've heard this before. Well, I like the Jesus of the New Testament, but I'm not a big fan of the God of the Old Testament. I mean, many of us, no doubt, have heard a statement like that uh, or something to that effect. And many of us, myself included, have probably wondered about that. Why does there seem to be such a disparity between what we see of Jesus Christ in the New Testament and the God that is often described to us in the Old? And that's a difficulty that I think is a very natural one for us to grapple with as Christians. But here's the truth that I believe is clearly presented in the Old Testament and definitely here in the book of Micah chapter 7, is that God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And that the God of the Old Testament that we see interface with the nation of Israel and the nations of the world is actually no different than the God that we see described in the New Testament through the life of Jesus Christ and the writings of the authors of the New Testament like Paul. Jesus, when he came, he came to present the love of God incarnate or made flesh amongst us. But God's demonstration of his love in the Old Testament is actually just as clear. But what I find often is we get bogged down in in a lot of the details that the Old Testament provides and we miss that description. And we miss what is actually, if we'll dive in and start to peel back some of these layers, what is very clearly described as a merciful and loving God. A lot of times we, we, are, are, we are recipients of a caricature of the God of the Old Testament or a, a half-truth or a half-picture of the God of the Old Testament. And people, uh, sometimes Christians included, like to leave out portions in order of, the, of the Old Testament and especially what God describes himself as in order to make a point or accomplish a nefarious purpose. But today, using Micah chapter 7, I want to show you the truth about who God is in his relationship with his people. So we're going to read all of Micah 7, then we're going to walk, we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to walk through this verse by verse to see what's described here. So Micah chapter 7, starting in verse number 1, the Bible says this, Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the grape leanings of the vintage, there is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. The good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward, and the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of the watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter riseth up against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. 
Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. Then she that is mine enemy shall see it and shame shall cover her, which said unto me, where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. In the day that thy walls are to be built, in the day that shall the, uh, in that day shall the decree be far removed. In that day also he shall come to thee from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from the fortress even to the river and from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. Notwithstanding, the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. Feed thy people with thy rod. Thy, with the, the flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in, in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their, at all their might. They shall lay their hands upon their mouth, mouth. their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. In the book of Micah, Micah is a prophet in the Old Testament times in the nation of Israel. Well, really, not quite the nation of Israel, but the nations of Israel. You see, at this time frame, the nation of Israel had actually split into two separate kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom of Israel and of Judah. And Judah is where Micah was primarily set to be a prophet of God to, to declare God's truth to his people. You see, the nation of Israel as a whole had gone through a a pretty intense time of social upheaval and, and moral decay. What they were supposed to be, they no longer were. They no longer followed after God in the way that they were commanded to and worshipped him through the the, the temple uh, sacrifices. They they no longer were obeying his commands for how to uh, keep their land with the planting and and sowing of crops and the yields that they received. They they were no longer handling their, their interpersonal affairs in the way that God deemed as necessary for them. There was no justice in the land. The Those that were in power, the book of Micah tells us, were taking advantage of those that were weak. The people that were in political and religious positions of leadership were not using those positions to lead for the benefit of the people, but instead were using those positions to gather unto themselves. Those in leadership were were receiving bribes. Those who were supposed to be spiritual leaders were also doing the same. And there was a lot of injustice going on in the land at this time. And the book of Micah, the prophet Micah begins to recount the impending judgment of God on his people. God says through Micah, because you have sinned against me, because you have turned your backs and refused to obey my commands, because you have allowed this injustice to rise up, because you have ignored the way of life that I have prescribed for you, I am going to have to destroy this way of life that you've come to find for yourselves. Micah says that there are going to, going, there are going to come nations that are going to come into Israel and conquer the nation of Israel and take them away into captivity. And we know from history that that happens just uh, a, few, a few years later when the nations of Assyria and the nation of Babylon and so forth, they come and they take, my, uh, they take Israel away and they destroy, destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple of God. And the nation of Israel uh, crumbles to shambles because of their lack of faith to follow after God's commands. But Micah also writes that God will return again for his people. That their lot in life will not be to be in captivity forever, 
but that God will once again in the future return to gather to himself the remnants of Israel and to bring them back to once again worship their God. We know that this happens historically when the nation of Israel is able to return from captivity to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But we also know that this is going to happen in the future when the Lord returns once again and he calls his own people to himself. And so there's all, even here in Micah, there's this, this idea of a fulfillment that's, that's partial, but then a fulfillment that's complete in Christ's first and second return. But here in Micah chapter 7, Micah is trying to recount the reality of what Israel is, has become and the decay that their nation has faced, but also the reality of who their God is in light of that decay. In the first couple of verses, we see the desperate state of society. Verses 1 through 6 of Micah 7 show us how far Israel has fallen, how bad it has become. I mean, look at this description. Micah begins with a a statement of despair. He says, woe is me. This this statement here is one of of distinct despair in Micah's voice. He's saying, look how bad this is. For I, and he describes the state that he or really God writing through him has come to. He says, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the grape leanings of the vintage. God says through Micah, hey, it's, it's as if I have come to reap what I planted. Oh, right? The farmer who comes to the grape vineyard to gather uh, that year's um, harvest, right? That, that idea of the vintage is that year's harvest to see the results of the rains and the, and the soil and the toil that that farmer has put in and, and to see his fruit come and, and be harvested together. He says, I have come as that farmer, but what have I found? I found that there is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit, but there was nothing there. This is what God describes Israel as. He says, I came to find righteousness, to find goodness, to find the result of what I had put into place in this nation, but there is nothing. Instead, this is what God finds. He says this in verse 2, the good man is perished out of the earth. There's no one there anymore that is good, that is able to be described as good. And there is none upright among men. They all, all the men, all the people, they lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man, his brother, with a net. This is what's going on socially, is that the people have become very selfish and self-centered in their dealings. And, and now, when they should be dealing justly with each other, oh, we know the verse in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? The result of what Micah writes about Israel is what brings us to that verse saying, God desires that you deal with each other justly and with humility and with mercy. But that was not how they were described. Micah says that they wait for each other with blood. They're they're looking to capture each other with a net. They're trying to trap each other with with unjust dealings. In verse number three, he says that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. I love this description because it's so clear that they're just looking for every opportunity to grab and and to do wickedness with both of their hands. They're they're busy bodies when it comes to accomplishing whatever comes to their mind. He describes the leadership. He says the prince, the, those in political leadership, asketh. And the judge, those in social leadership, asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire. So they wrap it up. The idea here is that those that are in leadership are, 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 are saying, yes, I will work on your behalf for the right price. Give me the right reward. Uh, Put things in my pocket, so to speak. Uh, uh, Give me something for my hand to gain for myself, and I'll deal on your behalf. I'll I'll judge on your behalf. I'll lead on your behalf. It was bribery to the core, and they, they were not even trying to hide it. They were wrapping it up in this bribery. It was just clear. Everyone could see it. In verse number four, Micah describes them this way. The best of them is as a briar. This thorny vine or hedge, right? The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. This description is so clear about even the good men are prickly, are rough. They will cut you to shreds is the description here. And Micah gives a a little picture right here to what's coming because of this reality. He says, and the day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. He says, O Israel, because of what you have become, The visitation of the Lord, the watchman of the Lord is coming upon you. His judgment is is at your door and now shall be their perplexity. 
Earlier in Micah, in the book of Micah, the description that was given was that the, the nation of Israel had this, this attitude, this arrogance about them that said, well, we're God's chosen people, so we can't fall. Israel knew their history. They knew how many times God had fought on their behalf. How many times that when they had no hope that God brought them the entire victory. And Israel in this, instead of being humble and saying, wow, what a great God who takes care of us and provides for us. They had instead become arrogant to think that they were untouchable. And they had this attitude, Micah says, that, that, that said, well, we will not face destruction because we are Israel, God's chosen people. And Micah says, oh, you're going to be perplexed because you're going to be standing there going, how are we destroyed? How are we uh, conquered? We're God's people. How has this come upon us? He says, you're not even going to realize that God's judgment has come upon you. Despite it being made clear through many prophets, through many warnings, you're not even going to know that you have faced the judgment of God because of your sin, your rejection of him. In verse 5, this description comes to a, such a clear head about the selfishness that has invaded Israel and all the people there. Micah says this, Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. It had become so bad in Israel that Micah says, you can't even trust your closest companions and family members. He says, don't trust your friend. Don't even trust your mentor. Don't even trust the loved one that you would allow to lay on your belly. Your children, the ones that have come to your family through marriage, through law, there is nobody that you can put your trust in. That's how far Israel has come and their decay of their moral guides that God has given to them through the law. But Micah, he gives us an example to follow in the next few verses. You see, Micah, in the face of all this calamity, all of this, this, this upheaval of the way of life that Israel was supposed to have, he, he demonstrates this idea of turning to God in faith. In verse number seven, Micah says this, this is his own testimony. He says, therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah says, in the face of all of this injustice, in the face of how you cannot trust anybody, this is the reality that's going on. Micah says, I'm not going to look left or right to put my trust in somebody. Instead, I'm going to look up to put my trust in God and in him alone. He says in verse eight, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. He says, don't rejoice against me. He says, when I fall, I shall arise. Now, Micah's statement here is not one of his own ability or his, his own power or righteousness. He says, I shall arise. Why? Because of the Lord. He says, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Now, we know that this isn't his own efforts because of the next verse. He says this, I will bear the indignation of the Lord against, of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Micah's statements here are not statements of arrogance or pride or even self-righteousness. Micah does not say, well, when I fall, when I face the reality of, of the, the uh, injustice of is that has come into Israel, I'm not going to get back up because I'm somehow strong. In fact, Micah clearly outlines, I am just as much a sinner. I have sinned against God. You see, the reality of the issue that Israel was facing was not, oh, well, they're facing God's punishment because they are sinners. Because then we would all be doomed in the same way without hope. It was that they had rejected the way of finding God's favor through obedience and faith in him. But Micah says, hey, the issue here, Israel, is not your sin because I am a sinner as well. But that your lack of turning to God as he has commanded you to. You see, my friends, this morning, when we come before God, we are exactly the same as Israel. We are selfish. I am a selfish person, okay? I was talking with my wife earlier this week after we were working through some things in our own relationship, and I looked at her and I said, look, I'm just going to be honest. I am a selfish person. I acknowledge that about myself. I have, I have really tried to be honest about the reality of my own heart, and even as good as I try to be, I know that my flesh and my heart leads me to value myself above all others, and if I allow my actions to follow those values they will be very hurtful, hurtful towards others. I am a sinful human being. My hope cannot be found in me. When I fall, I cannot arise. So how does Micah say that he will arise when he falls? 
that when he sits in darkness, there will be light that is displayed unto him because of the faith that he puts in God. Again, in verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. You see, what, what Micah points out is that the hope of Israel is not in themselves, but in their God who has brought them hope. In a few verses, we're going to see how Micah recounts how God has provided hope for Israel time and again, whether it be food or protection. God is always taking care of his people as a part of his promise. And God will take care of us when we claim his promise as his people. When we receive that that gift of salvation, that promise is not, oh, you will be righteous because of yourself. That promise is you will be righteous because of me. It's the same exact promise that Micah claims here where he says, God, I am a sinful human being who has sinned against you and absolutely should bear your indignation or your wrath against me. But Micah says, but instead I will receive the judgment as you work and plead my cause and execute judgment for me on my behalf. You see, the judgment that Micah is going to receive on his behalf is the judgment of God, not against Micah, but against Jesus Christ on the cross where he went and he bore the wrath of God for our sins. You see, Israel, their issue was not that they were not bearing their own righteousness, but that they were no longer looking to God by faith. You see, whether it be Israel in the Old Testament or you and I today, our way of salvation and our way of hope has always been the same. It is not through works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy that he has saved us, according to the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost. It is not my own works of righteousness that pick me up out of the miry clay, that set my feet upon a rock and establish my goings like the psalmist wrote. It is the goodness of God that is displayed towards me as I put my faith and hope in him and him alone. It is actually counterintuitive to put our trust in God because in that moment of trusting in him, we have to acknowledge that we have no hope in ourselves. I have to completely let go of trying to accomplish my righteousness by my own works. You see, as long as we are in any way, shape, or form looking to ourselves and our own works for righteousness, we are not finding that righteousness in Christ because faith says it's not me, it's only him. And Micah here says, I am going to turn, turn to God in faith. This is his personal resolve to trust in the Lord despite the despair around him. And this faith is an example to us. We should emulate Micah's faith and trust in God. Because in the end of verse 9, Micah says this, He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. In verse number 10, then she that is mine enemy shall see it and shame shall cover her, which said, said unto me, where is the Lord thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Micah reminds us that there is no enemy that can stand against the faith that we can put in Jesus Christ because that's when he works on our behalf. When our God lifts us up and brings us into light and righteousness. No man can take us out of that. Instead, they all fade away at the ultimate power of our God. From here, Micah leads us into a reminder of God's promise of restoration. You see, Micah, through his example of faith, shows exactly how we find favor in God once again by putting our trust in him and in him alone. He says, hey, it's not about simply the sacrifices of the animals, Israel. See, Israel had continued many of those those temple worship uh, actions, but there was no heart involved in them because of their disobedience and their ultimate rejection of God. And Micah says, it's not about the actions, it's about your heart, your trust in God that brings us back to him. And when we are brought back to God, Micah shows exactly what will happen in verse 11, starting in verse 11. He says, in that day, the day where we find the righteousness of God, where God works on our behalf once again, he says, in that day, thy walls are to be built. In that day, shall the decree be far removed. This is a a picture again of of an impending event in the not too distant future for Israel as they're released from captivity and Jeremiah and Ezekiel lead the people back to Israel to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem 
and to rebuild the temple. But it's also a reminder that we know now of the future promise of God where he says, I will return once again to claim that which is my own, to call my people, to call Israel once again to myself. Tonight in our evening service, uh, Pastor John is going to preach for us on Romans chapter 11 and, and to begin to unfold for us a little more about God's relationship with Israel and what that means for Israel's future despite their rejection of God. And that connects so, so beautifully into what Micah is teaching here in chapter 7 about Israel's future. You see, Micah says in verse 12, In that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria and from the fortified cities and from the fortress even to the river and from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. You see, Micah's description of this rebuilt city of Jerusalem is that it will draw mankind from all corners of the earth to the promise that that city represents, the promise of hope and restoration for mankind as found in Jesus Christ. You see, the promise of God's restoration to Israel is the promise that we see in Jesus. Because Israel itself doesn't draw all people to it, right? Now, we see throughout history that there were those that were very attracted to Israel because they saw God's hand of promise there. We see stories like Rahab or, or, or stories like Ruth who, who saw the reality of the hope that the people of God had and they wanted to be part of that. But we see more distinctly how Jesus Christ himself, as he is lifted up as the sinless sacrifice of God uh, to the cross, how he draws all men to himself. We see how because of Israel's rejection, again, what we're going to see in Romans chapter 11 tonight, God has opened up the, the promise of hope and salvation to the whole world and how you and I today because many, if not most of us tonight, today are, are not Jewish, we are Gentiles, non-Jews, right? We have hope that has been given to us. You see, Micah says that the hope that Israel is looking forward to if they will turn their faith back to God is not just the hope that is for themselves, but a hope that extends to the whole world. As Micah continues in the next couple of verses, he reminds again of this hope that God has already given to them in the time past. He says, notwithstanding, the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein for the fruit of their doings. He says, hey, yes, your land will be desolate because of the judgment of God, but God himself, in verse 14, he will feed thy people with thy rod. You see, God is still the good shepherd who leads his people to abundance and blessing. The flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitarily in the wood in the midst of Carmel, let them feed in, in Bashan and in Gilead. As in the days of old, you see, Micah reminds of how God in time past has always led his people to provision, to sustenance. You see, the argument would be against Micah, well, God has made our land to be desolate. Our crops are not doing well anymore. Of the things that we've planted, they're no longer uh, of, uh, giving us abundant harvests like they once did. Which there was a reason for that, because they had broken God's commands about how they should plant and, 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 and should cycle their crops in the fields and give rest to the land. But, but the people said, but how are we going to come back to Jerusalem and find abundance when it's once again, the land is desolate, it's barren. And Micah says, because the God that led you to hope in the time past, he led you to the abundance of Carmel to feed in Bashan and Gilead, just like the days of old, how God provided for you. He will provide for you once again because he is the same God. The same God who gave you water in the wilderness. The same God who brought manna from heaven. The same God who always made sure that you had exactly enough to eat to fill your bellies every time you went to find food. That God is still your God if you'll put your trust in him. In verse 15, he reminds us not just of the provision of God, but the protection of God. He says, according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. You see, as they came out of Egypt, God provided for them protection as they, as they were released through the, the ten plagues that was pronounced on Egypt as a whole, as Pharaoh allowed them to go. As Israel was exiting the land of Egypt, God lavished them with great gifts. He literally had the Egyptians bring incredible treasures of gold and of silver and of precious goods to give to Israel as these former slaves were leaving the nation of Egypt behind. As Israel wandered throughout the desert uh, uh, to first escape Egypt and God parted the Red Sea and then brought it crashing down on top of the armies of Pharaoh to, to conquer them on the behalf of Israel. How he provided water and manna like we talked about a moment ago. How he provided physical protection from the nations that rose up against them. You see, our God 
And the God of Israel has protected them and provided for them time and time again. This is the promise of restoration that Micah is desperately trying to remind them of. And he says that in this promise, the nations shall see and be confounded at their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. They shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Micah says, you will be so protected by the hand of your God once again that all nations who stand against you will be afraid of what you have found in the restoration that only God can provide. You see, Micah is not condemning Israel to be just a half or a portion of what they once had in their relationship with God, but he is saying God wants to fully restore you to the peak of your relationship with him and his blessing on you. Why? Why would God do that? Because it's his character. See, in these last few verses, Micah is going to highlight God's character of mercy and forgiveness. God's character of mercy and forgiveness. Look at verse 18. Micah asks this rhetorical question. Who is a God like unto thee? Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? And passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Have you ever had somebody that hurt you? The answer is obviously yes, right? We have all had people that have hurt us. And you know what? One of the hardest things about when somebody hurts you is? Is looking at them. Somebody who has desperately hurt you. I mean, deeply cut you in a very personal and intimate way. The hardest thing about that is seeing them. Their face pops up on social media. You pass by them in church. You see them at a family reunion. It's hard to pass by the reality of the way that they have hurt you in the past and not let that affect you again, isn't it? Because we're human. Because we struggle with the reality of being human and we're weak to provide true, unconditional forgiveness. But our God is not that way. You see, so, so many times we personify God in all the worst possible ways. We give him our worst characteristics. But our God is a God that provides perfect forgiveness. You see, he pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He passeth by it without a second thought. In the next verse, we see how he's able to do that. He does it because he casts all of our sins into the depths of the sea. I love how many descriptions the Bible has about how God handles our sins when we find forgiveness of him. Here it tells us that he casts them into the depths of the sea. In another place, it tells us that he sets our sins as far as the east is from the west. In another place, he tells us that he puts our sins literally behind his back so that he will not see them. It tells us that he remembers our sins no more. You see, so often our problem with God is not that he remembers our sins, it's that we remember our sins and that we don't actually believe that he is who he said he is. You see, the God of the Old Testament that is described here by Micah is a God that is overflowing with forgiveness. He literally chooses to not remember the sins of his people when they would turn back to him because it's who he is. But it's not just that he will forgive and pass by the transgression of his, the remnant of his heritage, but also that he retaineth not his anger forever. Why? Because he delighteth in mercy. What, what gives you pleasure? I mean, I want you to just take a moment. Like, think about this past week, maybe. What, what makes you just kind of, that, that uncontrollable smile come onto your face and, and just kind of giggle a little bit? I can tell you for one person what gives them pleasure. I, I can tell you for Kayla what gives her pleasure is little babies because uh, she's sitting here smiling at Jariah up here. And I love it. And that's, that's exactly the illustration. It's giving her pleasure to see this little baby and to smile at him and to see this, this new life. Right? That's the idea that we're talking about when we talk about delight. Everything else fades away 
as you just are absorbed in that moment of delight, of pleasure, of enjoyment, of rest, of hope. You want to know what the Bible tells us gives God that? When he gets to display mercy. How many of you love to display mercy? It's just like, it's the thing you look forward to. You're like, oh, yes, somebody did me wrong and they owe me, but I get to show them mercy. Anybody like that? Yeah, no, none of us are. Let's be honest, right? No, we sit there and we go, all right, now they owe me something. I'm going to come up with a million ways to exact my revenge. I am going to be like the, the excellent surgeon going in there with my scalpel to take that pound of flesh that is mine because I'm not going to show mercy. I'm going to take retribution. That's who we are, right? No, maybe it's just me. Okay, now you guys know the reality of me, so don't cross me, right? Uh, no, that's, that's the reality of our hearts. And because we struggle with that, we put that on our God, but it's not who our God is. You see, in the New Testament, it's so clear because we see Jesus, uh, Emmanuel, God with us, the, the God of, of heaven made flesh to walk amongst us, and we see him display mercy. We, we see the account of him on the cross where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what, he, what they do. We see the description of how he is whipped and wounded, how his body is literally broken and shredded for our sins, and how he does not open his mouth at all, but instead is as a lamb lamb brought before the slaughter. We see his humility and his meekness there uh, demonstrated through the account of his life. And because it's so clear as with him in human flesh, we think, oh man, what a beautiful representation of the mercy of God in Jesus. But we forget that the God of the Old Testament is this exact same God as he demonstrates mercy to his people time and again, as they wrong him, as they betray him, as they forsake his covenant that he has made unconditionally with them, as they turn their backs on him, as they reject him, as they are literally the harlot who was, who was bought out of, out of that prostitution and brought to a loving husband, but goes right back into that work of desolation once again. That is Israel who God time and again went seeking after and said, if you'll just come back to me, I will forgive you. I will restore you. I will demonstrate mercy to you because that is who I am. It is the long, the greatest longing of my heart, our God says. It is the greatest desire of my character, of my being, to demonstrate mercy to those that I love. It's what brings me the greatest delight is to show that to you. See, Micah says this to Israel. This is who your God is. Yes, this generation will face an impending destruction that is coming their way, but it is not the end, O Israel. Instead, the end is that you have hope in God if you will turn back to him because it is his character to show mercy and to give forgiveness. And our God is a just God. In verse number 19, Micah says, he will turn again. Not he might, not you can hope that he does, not if he's feeling good in that day. He will turn again to you. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue or press down so they are no longer in the forefront, our iniquities. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou, our God, will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Your sins, when we turn back to our God, he takes them and he gets rid of them. You see, we think of our God as sitting there with the list when we try to turn back to him who's standing there going, yeah, I know you want to come back to me, but uh, do you remember when you did this? And do you remember when you did that? And man, this one was pretty wicked. I'm just going to be honest. And instead, we, we see our God as taking our sins and dangling them over our head, of marking them on our forehead so we are there with shame. But Micah says that's not what he does. He has taken our sins and he has cast them to the depths of, our, of the sea and remembers them no more. And instead, we see this final promise that Micah reminds Israel of. Instead, God is described this way in verse 20. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob 
and the mercy to Abraham. This reference to Jacob and Abraham is a way of referring to Israel as a nation. Jacob, Jacob and Abraham are, are two of the patriarchs of Israel, right? Abraham is the father of the nation. Jacob would be uh, Abraham's descendant two generations later, and the one who was originally renamed by God to be Israel. These are the ones who received the promise of God about what Israel would become and receive the covenants of God uh, on their behalf for their descendants. And Micah says, hey, those promises, the truth that God gave to Israel, the mercy that God shows to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old, that God that was there with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob, that God is the same God that is here with you today, Israel. His promise still stands. He is faithful. He has not turned his back on you. He will fulfill what he has promised to you. He has not forsaken you. He will receive you one Once again, if you will simply turn unto him for forgiveness and mercy. This is the God of the Old Testament. This is just one passage in the book of Micah. We could do this exact same thing in in dozens of other places within the Old Testament, not even have to flip that many pages in the Bible. This is the God that sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. I think it's partially because God knew how much we would struggle with with the relationship with him because he is in heaven and we are on earth. And so he knew that we would need to see his love made flesh and walk amongst us to, to be able to see it and to feel it and to touch it and to know its reality. But it is no different than the God who has demonstrated in the writings of the Old Testament as he deals with his people graciously time and again. Oh, he is still the God that will have to judge sin. When we turn our backs on God, when we have an opportunity to repent from our sin and to put our faith in him, but we choose instead to turn away from him and pursue our own desires, to pursue, pursue our own devices, we will face judgment, no, not unlike what Israel faced. My friend, if, if you are here today and you have not truly, like what God commands Israel to do, put your faith and trust in God and his work of righteousness on your behalf alone, you're in the same lot as Israel is as Israel is facing here in the book of Micah. Destruction that is unnecessary because your God has a promise for you to receive, a forgiveness of mercy. But when we reject the work of Jesus Christ by refusing to turn again unto him, we're in the same place that Israel is here. As we bring this thought to a close this morning, I want us to think about the reality of the moral state of the people here in the book of Micah. It's not unlike us. We are selfish. We are self-centered, looking to gain for ourselves, even the best among us. I promise you, struggles with that pride, that selfishness. But we see Micah's resolve to trust in the Lord and how even in these difficult circumstances that we face, the reality of the world around us, even if, we can't, even if we struggle to see the selfishness in our own heart, we can see it in the world around us, don't we? But even in the face of that selfishness, how this world would chew us up and spit us out, we can put our faith and have hope in God, just like Micah did. Because Micah knew the reality of God's mercy and forgiveness. How God will receive us, forgive us, pronounce mercy on us, and give us the entirety of his righteousness. And so instead of being stuck in the mire of our sin, we have hope for our future. And we can look at our lives, whether it be in times past to see the mercy of God that was abundantly displayed on us, or times present, how we know, hey, I need that mercy today. Today we can resolve, God, I want to see your mercy for what it truly is. I want to receive your forgiveness because it is already there. God is not waiting to forgive. He has already forgiven on the cross. He has already paid your penalty. In 1 John chapter 2, the Bible tells us he is the propitiation or the the total satisfaction of our sins. And not ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. When just a few verses before that, the Apostle John writes that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, what he's reminding us is that he is faithful and just because he has already done it. 
That forgiveness is already present for us if we will confess our sins to him. The idea is the same thing Micah is calling for here. To turn back to our God, to confess our sins to him, and to receive his forgiveness and his mercy. Friend, I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God today. Maybe today you are there receiving his mercy actively because you see him for who he truly is. The God of love and forgiveness who has pronounced many spiritual blessings on you and has received you consistently despite your failures. But because your faith is in him, you know confidently that I am found in him and my forgiveness is already complete in him because it's his promise to me. If that's where you're at today, then let's take a moment to rejoice together. That, like we sang a moment ago, all my life he has been faithful. All my life he has been so, so good. Because why? His goodness has relentlessly pursued me. But maybe you're not there. Maybe you're like where I found myself so many times. Struggling because I've forgotten or not even known about the reality of God's mercy and forgiveness towards me. Maybe you're struggling to even find a way out of your sin and to put your faith in God because you're not even really sure that your God wants to forgive you, that he would show mercy to you. Maybe you're looking at your life going, man, I have messed up so badly and strayed so far from my God. How could he ever receive me again? And God is sitting there on pins and needles, just waiting to do what he loves to do in his relationship with mankind, to show mercy. What does Paul say in the book of Romans? Where sin did abound, where there was lots of sin, grace did much more abound. If you're here today and you're going, man, I am a great sinner. My sin has abounded. Fantastic you get to receive even more of God's grace to cover that sin. What a blessing. That is who our God is.